London, but second year of university, I knew that I was studying accounting and finance, and I knew in second year that I did want to become an accountant. I knew I wanted to become a writer, but I didn't know what that looked like. But at the time in uni, I was part of a creative society, helping to organise literary and music events in Hertfordshire. For anyone who's at that time, it was like the bubbling, <laughs> the bubbling place. Um, and I would come down to London and do my first open mic night was at Batsy Art Centre. Friends signed me up because I hated performing, the confidence to do it and all of that. I also came to Jaw Dance, just went about and I just spent that time just meeting people and getting to know people. It wasn't about you know, trying to get on the stage, trying to be seen, it was just about understanding, understanding the scene, like again, you know, Yomi, the Jacob Samuel Rose, people who were there, and just getting to know people for who they are, and also what, what the scene is in terms of what people are writing, because it's very different when you're watching Death Jam online or watching the American scene, it's not the same thing. And when I left uni, I did a Barbican Young Poets program, and that was also really about meeting people and networking. And I joined Six Weeks Creative Collective, which Caleb was part of, and we would just we would meet every Monday and we would just talk, and we would just talk about what we're creating, collaborate with each other. And I think in that time, what I the, the key things I learned: one, I learned patience, because that time, what you what you really want is just to break out. And I was actually saying to Yomi beforehand just how much now I cherish those quiet moments. Because especially now that we live in a digital world, whatever you put out stays there forever, even when you take it off. And that's one thing that I wish I was more patient, but it's something that I definitely, but I was privileged just because I was living at home. And I had the time to, I was able to take my time to find my voice and find who I was. Because you're trying to figure it all out. Um, and also the idea of what a poet meant. I didn't know what it, and people still ask me, what, what does a poet do? And I'm like, a poet is just an umbrella term for a million things. And, but I was lucky that I had, and probably being a curious person, I would reach out to people and I would ask, what does it mean to be a poet? So Jacob Samuel Reza would literally meet up with him at the Barbican and we would just talk, he would read my poems, um, and I needed that, and that's one advice I would give, that was something that I, I'm proud of myself for, for doing. And the other thing was, you know, just learning. So I would um, reach out to poets and ask, "Can I shadow you? You know, while you teach?" I just wanted to learn different things. I started producing events as well with Enya Ellens, and so that time was just. Yes, I wanted to write, but it was also just all the different things that that could come with, and just playing around um, with it. But in terms of grafting and finding yourself, that's the hardest part because you feel that you have to write the way. I remember a time when everyone was writing about Wilson Chair. I don't know if I don't know if you ever knew that time on Tumblr. Everyone was writing about bones and breath and all of that. And it's, uh, <laughs> like, if your poem didn't have a bone in it, would you be writing? Um, at that time, at that time, that I've been there, so I know it. Um, and I really learned what it meant to find my voice because if I kept writing in that way, I got to a point I was really unhappy my writing. Um, I was writing about you know things that would get clicks, but I would go home and I did it just vacuous um, myself. I wasn't in there. Um, and so it was about also finding myself and probably being around other black writers helped because I was around you know British Nigerian writers and Caribbean writers but understand that like, we're so different on a you know on a personal level so our work has to be different. But if I didn't spend time with them I wouldn't come to that realisation. Um. We're going to touch on your second, thank you by the way, but we're going to touch on your second collection. Um, your debut. Even to write a second collection of poetry, I rate this highly because me, I'm still running to try to write one single poem with a single book. I'm like, I hate people. After you get your debut, you want to give some time. And when you're talking about finding a voice, that journey to your first collection for people who might not be aware, would you mind just talking briefly about? Um, what that kind of entry point is, like we're not talking bones, we're not talking breath. <laughs> we're going to try and put those things to one side, or we're going to enter this in this in this kind of debut collection. And what was that like in that journey of finding a voice to get to that first collection of, of work? So you probably see this, but you're always still finding your voice. I feel oh, like I've only just settled, I've only just arrived now with the second book, but. 
the first book was, I found that with writing, I was really interested in intergenerational relationships. So my, my grandfather um, was someone who I, I was returning to in my work. And also I found I was interested in form. I really enjoyed, because I came in through slam poetry, once I started writing and studying um, poetry, form was the one thing that excited me the most. And also um, thinking about faith and the Bible as a, as a poetry book in itself, and those influences and Pentecostal church and you know um, audience participation, all of those things. But I, it was really about what am I most curious about? What are the, the forms of languages that excite me? And those were all the things I brought into the book. And at the time, I was thinking about mental health and grief. So it's how can I translate these themes that I'm burdened by? How can I translate it in ways that are, yeah, that are meaningful? Would you mind just letting folks know the title of the first collection that was on? Yeah, that, that collection is called In Search of Equilibrium. Um, the first book that you're going to introduce for us this evening as well, because we've got two books for us this evening. Um, and I don't know what your first selection or what your first choice is, which one you want to talk about. Let's give you a book first. So this is Haruki Murakami, Cut from the Shore. Does anyone read it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was one nod. No, I've never done that air horn to a book. It's because you've read it. It's because yeah, you've read it. Yeah, the, book, the book's lit. The book's lit. <laughs> um, let me just stop it for folks yes, while yes. I talk about the books. So this is the book. Okay. Um, talk to us about the book. It's a very strange book. So Haruki Murakami is a Japanese author, iconic, writes fiction, short stories, and his genre is kind of surrealist, so it's surrealism fiction, um, coming of age, it tends to explore themes of loneliness, longing, and love. And in this book, it follows a, a young boy on his 15th birthday who decides to run away from his father's home in search of, we're not quite sure it's mysterious to us, but I'm likely in search of his mother and sister um, who left when he was four. And it explores this, how you know our childhood traumas are things that we've lost. We're always in some ways looking for them, looking for their reflections in other people. So he meets another, a, a woman, um, Miss um, Seko, who he becomes, he becomes obsessed with. And she's also, 